Finally, <laughs> we got a DT-466 mechanical at the VNR yard. This one got towed in, so we know nothing about this engine, but the truck isn't even in that bad of shape. Tires are really good, and uh, it's not completely rotten. We got a little breather hole here, but the rest of the cab is okay, but in my younger years, I'd probably, I'd consider fixing this truck up and making a nice float truck. Now well, let's just see if we can get it running and talk about everything wrong with a DT-466. Here we go. We've made lots of these videos on all the different engines <laughs> and if you break it down, it, this engine weighs quite a bit and is a little bit underpowered and the return lines leak. And that's about it. Okay, so these are extremely reliable stout engines. But before we get into that, we're gonna try and start it because I haven't seen too many massive catastrophic failures other than uh, neglect. So um, this one looks like it's all together. All the pieces are there, the transmission's there. There's a water pump and some exhaust laying down in the cab. But uh, let's try and get it fired up first. Then we'll, I can't say it's the best engine and I come in with a seized engine. So <laughs> let's see if we can get it going. <laughs> we need some access to the batteries, so. They're down here. We have one maybe good battery. That might might work. <laughs> I have my doubts. Is it green? It is green. Let's see if it let's see if one battery is enough to start this thing in the middle of summer. These do not have a grid heater or glow plugs. So you're relying completely on the engineering of the international team. One battery, let's see if it does. So it has three, but... <laughs> yeah, it has three, no, it's only 12 volt, but... Depending on how long it's been sitting like this, the, open, the top is open, so the exhaust is probably full of water. Okay, so I didn't really come with any tools, and there's no key in there. Oh, and I need a dime. Oh, I got one dime. Right there. That's a good sign. Yeah. So something's clicking. The relay's clicking, but nothing's happening. Hey, two wrenches. They make these starters tamper proof, so they put a piece of plastic in between the the main battery cable and the ignition. So you gotta put one on the ignition and then you gotta kind of touch. So it's a little awkward. Tamper proof, so we're gonna tamper with it. <laughs> neutral it's got air brakes and they are 100% applied until we build air pressure so there was zero chance of this thing moving. but it's not having it so I think the compressor my diagnosis would be that the compressor is what was the final straw in scrapping this truck you collect water over time <laughs> nobody's drained this for a while so a little bit of air pressure there let's uh let's see if we can move it anyway Oh, yeah, that 
Okay. Break. <laughs> uh oh. He doesn't set it up. All right, so the DT-466 as an engine as a whole with that name started in the early 70s and went right up to 2016. They were mechanical injection pumps until 1995, I believe. Mid 90s, they had tighter emissions. They went to an electronic, uh, a Huey design. And then again, I think it got revamped in 2004 again for emission stuff as well. A couple issues with them and they're very minor. We're gonna basically talk about the mechanicals because I don't recommend swapping in an E. Even though they're readily available, they are prone to a lot of problems. And if you want your project to be reliable and stress-free, um, the E's are not that, especially when you take it out of its uh, platform and put it in something else. I'm sure it's been done, it's just that's not what I would recommend. I had a 1994, which is the P-Pump style. I think 93 to 95 had the Bosch P-Pump on the DT-466 in my 4900 service truck. I was mobile mechanic, I had a 14-foot um, IMT box on it with a nice crane on it. I love the truck, and if you were to look for a bus or an engine for like a conversion that's the sweet sweet little engine the 93 to 95 had a bigger pump this is a pretty small pump um and physically you wouldn't be able to get the amount of just plain and simple you can't get the fuel out of a pump that doesn't have a big enough bore to support that that fuel so again kind of a, a dog now i have heard on these engines uh on looking online um people saying that the cam followers wiped out the cam lobe um, but I don't think that's that common, and I think that becomes a maintenance issue, not a defect in the um, in the engine itself. You always hear people, oh, I had this happen, I had that happen. Um, we're, we go over the common problems that even with proper maintenance might still show up because of a stupid design flaw, and this engine really doesn't have any. Um, if you want a reliable engine, um, this is your this is your girl. If you tow to the racetrack and you blow this engine up, you can rebuild this in between your runs down the track and drive the truck home again. It is, uh, parts are readily available, um, and there are hundreds and thousands of these available as well. And they go all over the world. There's a ton of these shipped over to Africa, uh, Venezuela, uh, Belize, um, and Dunville Auto Records used to just stuff shipping containers full with these engines. And, and unfortunately, we don't have that many anymore. So when they called and said, we have one in the yard, we don't know anything about it, we thought we'd quickly make this video. I think this one is for sale. We would buy it, but Kevin doesn't want to put it in the interrogator because his uh, triple nickel is running okay. Um, and it's just more work that uh, neither one of us have time for right now. So we're gonna, unfortunately, I think we're gonna pass on this one, but uh, you shouldn't, you should definitely buy this one. I think they want 1500 or 200, two grand for this engine. And uh, it could be yours in your dream project. I think the number one complaint overall is not about reliability or cost of ownership, it's that they're kind of a dog. They are underpowered, but that's what makes them reliable. It's a 1400 pound engine, dry. Um, if you start dressing it, you're getting up to, with all the oil in it, you're probably looking at 16, 1700 pounds. Um, and for that amount of weight, you're starting out the lower end of it was about 174 horsepower. I think uh, uh, generally the ones you see are going to be around in the mid 200s. And then towards later years, they made it up to 350 horsepower. I think the Army got 375 horsepower because they're special. They get that extra 25, 24 horsepowers. But the injection pump, with if you've got the mechanical, you can turn it up exactly the same way you do with a 5.9. You can put some governor springs in there, slide the fuel plate ahead. I don't know if you want to start messing with turbos. I never did. I left my service truck stock at the time. I wasn't into tuning anything up. And the only thing that has ever let me down is uh, those stupid uh, rubber return lines on the injectors. It's a, it's a maintenance thing. Every two years, you, they dry out, they crack, they rot, and they leak fuel all over the valve cover. Not a big deal. You swap them out um, and you buy it in a kit. Stupid little clamps on each injector and out the door you go again. It's not even too dry. It's like everything that I'm pointing out that's wrong with these engines is not wrong with this engine.
Okay, so the reason that it's so heavy is because it is a sleeved engine, meaning that um, when you pull the head off, you will see a big fat ring around the piston. You can remove your rod and your piston and you can knock that sleeve out. Exactly the same as the 8.3s. The Caterpillars, uh, the 3126, which is comparable to this, weighs a lot less. It's because it's all that extra meat in that thick sleeve that's removable. Meaning this is cheap to rebuild, whereas the 3126, if your block is scored or toast, you need to sleeve it yourself or uh, bore it out. And that is a very costly uh, way to fix things. So we chose the 3126 in our F350 because it weighs less. And we found a block that was in good shape that didn't have many kilometers on it. So we can rebuild it and we can get our next 200,000 kilometers out of it trouble free more if you stay up on your maintenance. This thing was in a pile of international trucks, which would have been the 4900s. I think the 4700 had the 444s in it, the V8s, but the 4900 is what you're looking for. And then the earlier models like this one uh, would have the S1900 would have the GT466s in them as well. And the earlier predecessors in the 70s our issue is that the rest of the trucks rot away long before these engines are towed. I'm sure there was something else but I have no idea what models you are but definitely comment down below on all the other models that I'm forgetting about. Okay so if you can see the oil pan how much clearance there is between this and the uh, the front axle um, you can see there's nothing stupid in the way there's nothing hanging off it you don't need to remove one thing to get at something else you rebuild this, you just drop the pan and everything is right there with tons of room. Um, the filters are nice and easy to get at, nice big starter at the back. We got uh, oil filters on the one side, fuel filters on the other. Just very well thought out, planned out engine. Um, and it would be stellar if it wasn't for the emission stuff going on it, uh, which started plaguing it with electronic problems. So I love this thing. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. <laughs> this is, uh, I, I'm, I'm looking at you, James, because <laughs> I see some shiny marks here and some marks here and some marks here that kind of look like forks. <laughs> and I, uh, I, I could have blown up this engine. Um, I had oil pressure. And I could fire it up again to prove it. <laughs> but this oil pan is punched in. So what that does is push up against the strainer. Now you're blocking the strainer from picking up the oil, and uh, you could I could have damaged I could have blown this engine up, but I could have also rebuilt it in a weekend. Okay, so the E's we had a lot of um, stupid issues that when they first came out we had our oil in giant bins and we used compressed air to pump oil into the engine. When the first one rolled into the shop in 1996 I think or 97 when when, when it came in. We pumped the oil into the engine and the engine wouldn't start. Couldn't figure it out. Um, waited, uh, messed around with it all day, left it overnight and then came back in the um, morning and it fired right back up again. And after talking to Tex, and I don't know whether it's true or not, um, going back and forth with International, they said that when we're using the compressed air to push the oil into the engine, we were aerating the oil and that was enough to screw up the Huey system. Um, and it wouldn't start. Some sensors or what were going wonky and saying we're not starting this this engine. The, what, overnight, the air was able to settle to the or float to the top of the oil, and it fired up the next day. So every oil change that we did when we knew that a, a, an E was coming in, we just poured it in from a pail and uh, rather than from our giant tank, and we never had that issue again. Whether that was true or fluke, it wasn't me working on the engine at the time. That's what the techs. Uh, we're told and that's what the end diagnosis was for the customer and after that they got the E's got a really bad name for uh, in the shop for being the stupid engine that can't even have uh, pumped oil go into the engine. Uh, we had a bunch of these in garbage trucks and the garbage trucks uh, were in horrible conditions um, meaning like a lot of fluids and, and really raunchy fluids and a tiny bit of corrosion and one plug somewhere would shut the whole truck down. So basically at that point, they're like, yeah, if you can find a mechanical pump, um, keep that truck on the road as long as you possibly can because the Ease just had all these, not that mechanically it was a, still a good stout engine, as just the, the, the system to get it running and the system to keep the emissions in line uh, was a giant pain in the ass. 
So take that for what it's worth. Um, I left the shop uh, early 2000s and that was the main complaints uh, about the ease uh, up until I left, so. Sorry this is a short video. <laughs> it's one of our shorter videos on everything wrong with because there's not that much wrong with it. If you find a GT466, go out there and buy it up. We're not gonna buy this one because we're, we're kind of broke. We bought something else again. <laughs> well, once that's paid for, then we'll come back and talk to VNR. Um, lots of stuff at VNR. If you guys see anything in the videos, the Kubota video too, if you comment, um, hit up uh, thebossacquiries at gmail.com if you wanna buy anything. Call up the yard, swing in, uh, talk to the guys. Uh, most of the stuff is for sale. If it's not sold within a couple of weeks, it just goes into the shredder. So um, I think the, somebody's got dibs on this. Uh, if they don't, we'll tell them to hold on to it for a while. Maybe we'll use it in a year or so. But uh, definitely comment down below on whatever else you want us to review. Definitely check out DGHD where we do all our off-road stuff. Um, we've got combines and excavators and skid steers and everything going on there. Check that out and uh, get out there and walk through scrap yards and see what's available. It's always a good time uh, and it's usually free. It's kind of hazardous to your health, but it is free. <laughs> Thanks for watching, guys. Here we go.